If there's one thing humans can't stand, it's the actual physical world. Why else would we have spent years trying to make virtual reality a success? For as long as we've been able to render computer-generated worlds, we've fantasized about transplanting our minds into the artificial realm. But for all our decades of dreaming, the history of VR in the real world is essentially a story of failure. The early 60s saw dalliances with immersive theatre such as Morton Halig's smell-producing Sensorama or Telesphere Mask, but VR got its first proper airing when respected computer scientist Ivan Sutherland described what he called the ultimate display. A head-mounted, room-filling wonder gadget that, Sutherland hoped, would prove a looking glass into a mathematical wonderland. Sutherland's tech was truly mind-bending, but as we know, the public's appetite over the next two decades was for computers that were a little more two-dimensional. Nevertheless, VR was growing behind the scenes. Industrial synth, crude wireframe environments, it can only be the mid-80s. A time when systems like NASA's virtual visual environment display were proving the potential of VR outside the consumer sphere. Shown off in 1986, two tiny LCD screens and a helmet-mounted sensor promised a final frontier of remotely controlled space hardware. Back on Earth, the 80s saw virtual reality become a familiar term, one popularized by Jaron Lanier of VPL, which developed the Data Glove, an ancestor of the infamous Power Glove from the Nintendo Entertainment System. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Public interest flared, and suddenly the VR revolution was just around the corner. The focal point for that enthusiasm was to be the games industry, and in the mid-90s, VR started to creep into our homes. There were outliers like Forte's VFX-1 Now I'm into this game! But Sega and Nintendo, at the time the biggest names in gaming, also had a go. The Sega VR made it to arcades, but the console version was cancelled, a decision Nintendo should have learned from before building the Virtual Boy. Released in the US in August 1995, the Virtual Boy, which offered monochromatic 3D gaming through a boxy headset, had nothing going for it. It was expensive, the games looked terrible, Nintendo stripped out head tracking from the prototype, and most worryingly, gamers complained of headaches and nausea when using it. A critical and commercial failure, the Virtual Boy was canned the next year. Marketing aside, the Virtual Boy was VR only in the weakest sense, but as a poster child for the concept, its failure saw virtual reality take a big hit. This is the Oculus Rift. Today, with vastly improved hardware, we're once more ready to give VR a try in a new virtual reality flair ignited by Oculus Rift, which in 2012 stormed Kickstarter, earning over a million dollars in crowdfunding in only a few days. Since then, Microsoft, Samsung, Sony, HTC, Valve, and many more have thrown their hats into the VR ring. Will VR finally stick or not? Well, there are signs that this time, things could be different. Today's VR is being pioneered by tech makers like Samsung and HTC, who desperately need a next big thing as heat from the smartphone boom cools, so there's plenty of enthusiasm and resources in the war to make VR work. Then there's the social web, which opens up a new frontier for VR beyond gaming. We've already seen VR social networks, and with Facebook now in charge of Oculus, the virtual worlds to come could be a lot chattier than we anticipated. What VR has never ever done though is win over the public. So if you really want to know whether this stuff could ever take off, all you have to do is ask yourself, do I want this in my life? So, do you?